the Echo Chamber, brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers. And sponsored by March Communications, connecting innovation and people. Welcome to the Echo Chamber. This is Arun Sudama from The Homes Report, and we're joined today on the line from Dubai uh, by Alex Malouf from Procter & Gamble and IABC and Mepra and possibly more organizations. I don't know if I'm missing any, but Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, and I think that's more than enough organizations for, uh, for one podcast. More than enough. So this is, a, as you know, this is a spe- special show. Um, uh, many of our listeners, I'm sure, uh, have, been, have been waiting for this, for this because it is our 100th episode. Um, although I should actually point out, it's technically not really our 100th episode. Um, it's our 100th since we uh, started keeping count. Um, but there were, I think, an, a, f- a few shows we did before. Uh, and then when we transitioned from one platform to another, they they slipped through the cracks. So, you know, technically, in the best in the best traditions of of, of revisionist history, um, which I think is, is I think you're quite familiar with in in, in your region. Um, Aaron, have you ever you ever thought about working in PR? <laughs> this this is our hundredth show, so we'll talk a little bit perhaps about um, some of the themes that have emerged over the last what is it four to five years um, on this show. And um, quite glad to have you here to do that with us, Alex. Um, how before we start, how how are you seeing how are you seeing the industry's progress and growth from your vantage point? Because there's so much talk at the moment about broken models and uh, broken reputations uh, and so forth. Well, it's been I think an interesting year for pretty much everybody globally when it comes to the issue of ethics and reputation. I think there's probably a lot of people who are tired of, of hearing the word ethics, but um, I, I do see 2018 as, as being, again, I'd rather say reputation than ethics because I think reputation is, is uh, wider, it's more encompassing. And I think it also highlights not only what we need to do internally in terms of you know cleaning up how we Act, but also as well how we're perceived by others. I think that's still a challenge that we all face um, in terms of the industry. Um, and then there's another thread, which is obviously the change over the past couple of years, so the the move or the rise of digital, which you know is is all encompassing. Um, but I think the you know, the big lessons from this year and also last year has been, you know, the the use of or the misuse of social media by different parties especially when it comes to politics and and what possibly that may mean for next year especially uh, and i think everybody should see this coming in with the the impact of greater regulation on social media yeah it's it's a really interesting point and we'll we'll probably talk about that a little bit but you, you started off talking about ethics i mean that's as good a place to start as any when i look back over the uh, the hundred or the ninety nine episodes before this ethics has been a an issue that has come up time and time again obviously given added impetus this year because of the Bell Pottinger scandal um, which of course uh, shone a spotlight I think on on PR industry ethics uh, and not a, not necessarily a favorable one um, since then of course we've had uh, various various initiatives we had the uh, the Helsinki Declaration. Um, and then we had Richard Edelman, of course, calling for a, uh, a kind of PR compact. You, you actually, on our website, um, just to plug our website, of course, you, you, uh, you wrote a column in the wake of Richard Edelman's comments where you argued that uh, any, any PR ethical watchdog cannot be in the US. Uh, what, what, what was your view there? Well, I think you've you've got to look at ethics from the point of view of of culture. Um, ethics isn't isn't uniform um, across the globe. You know, you live in Hong Kong, which is part of China, um, and you know things are done differently in every single region. Um, I think we've we've got to take a more nuanced approach 
um, especially in light of, of how you know emerging markets, and again, it's okay, it's a little bit of a cliche, emerging markets, but how PR is doing in in places like Africa and the Middle East and Asia. Um, you know, I'd love to see what the breakdown is between you know the the West, the US, and Western Europe, and, and then revenues from other parts of the world. But um, a lot of people over here are a little bit tired of, of continually hearing, you know, this is how it's done over there, and and you know, being almost feeling as if they're being lectured to. So we, we've got to take a global approach. We can't just simply say, look, you know, the US is going to lead on this, because again, if you you've noticed, Paul's noticed. Um, we're not we're not doing too great in terms of ethics when it comes to the West as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, but the one thing I would say, I think, is, um, I mean, you wouldn't, particularly, you know, you, you work for a big multinational, um, and you you wouldn't take the view that different ethical standards are allowed in different countries, I would assume. Um, would you? I... Look, I, I wouldn't, mm. um, but I I do think that again, you know, if you're looking at let, let's let's take Bell Passenger as an example. What was done uh, was obviously unethical, but how did this come to light? It came to light through the media, mm -hmm. through a hack, through the media, then picking up in South Africa. It actually wasn't picked up by initially by the industry. No, uh, it was no, picked up by no, civil society, yeah, yeah. and um, and they led on this, and then it, it, it then followed on. The PRCA stepped in after a complaint was made, mm -hmm. um, and then we saw how the process rolled out. And, and and I'd ask you, you know, being you know not of the industry but following the industry, how did you see that playing out? How could we do a better job in terms of policing ethics? It's a, I mean, that's a really tough one. So I I, I can speak. For my own experience with this story, um, I when I when it first came to light, I must confess, I didn't take it that seriously because I thought, you know, I thought it's Bell Pottinger. They've had these issues in various countries. They're Bell Pottinger. It'll blow over. Yeah. Um, they, they've handled worse. That's exactly what I thought. And it's only when I went to South Africa earlier this year. And I saw, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd seen the media reports before that, and I had actually thought, wow, this is, this is some pretty good reporting going on here, all from South Africa, by the way, really important, I think, to make that point. This was all, all the efforts of some really good journalists, I think, um, within that country. But when I went there, I realized that people on the street were talking about it, which is, is, is unique, let's say, uncommon, at least. And it was at that point I, I, I kind of realized that this story was going to go on for quite a while, and so that was when we started covering it. Now, so that's from our perspective, and we're not, and you know, we're not. We would never claim to be an ethical watchdog, but we're certainly uh, a vehicle by which you could perhaps shine a light on some of these things. I'm not entirely sure what the industry could have done at any point earlier, because you know, trade associations, by dint of the way they're sort of set up, they they kind of need a complaint made to them, right? Um, you almost have to hope that behavior is better based on training and standards and, and everything that goes in yeah. so that this outcome never happens in the first place, right? And I think this is where Richard Edelman's points were well made and that there needs mm. to be a body or bodies who support the, the training of the industry mm. in terms of ethics. I think that was, that was a, a very smart call. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there will be progress made on that next year uh, with a number of the different associations, be it the mm. Global Alliance, be it IBC, be it PRCA, but hopefully a, a campaign of, of all of the associations coming together. So I think that was a very smart call. Um, mm. I think in terms of the policing, this is again where it gets, gets difficult because you know if you look at my region, yours is not too dissimilar. We don't have the type of media that you have in South Africa in terms of bringing these issues to light and mm. that's where it becomes a real challenge and obviously if we cannot see when wrongdoing is being done you know, as an association or as associations then what do you do to rectify you can't do anything yeah right you just have to hope that it's not being done you have to hope that there's enough education and all the rest of it as you've just said and there are standards and, and people are adhering to them 
Um, yeah. So we, we have to hope and pray, but is that enough? Um, no. I, I really don't know. I, I don't think so. No, it isn't enough. And, and it's a good point because it, it, it reminds us of the value of the information, of accurate, credible information of, of, of an open media uh, and the role they play. Um, so anyway, I don't want to dwell too long on, on ethics because I think we have, we have uh, discussed that ad nauseum, let's say, in, in, in recent weeks. Um, one thing I did want to talk to you about, though, is um, your, your view on this whole kind of integration of communications and marketing. Uh, again, looking back over the echo chambers of run, this is something that's been discussed again and again. I'm not entirely sure where that much further on than when this show started uh, but it was it was given um, it was given uh, perhaps a bit more of the spotlight uh, last week I was at a conference here in Hong Kong the Asia Pacific Communication Summit um, so it was all in-house comms people so all of your brethren Alex from, from, <laughs> from various companies thank you my brotherhood uh, yeah yes exactly and sisterhood um, in fact, you should you should have been there. I think you would have you would have enjoyed it because uh, the the head of communications from um, HSBC, Pierre Gode, um, made a very punchy speech. I thought where he said uh, unequivocally, he said communications will beat marketing, uh, and you know, no one had, had had asked him this question. He just um, it was just. You know, presented as his opinion, and, and fair play came out with it. Yeah, yeah, fair play to him for, for coming out with it. And you know, Pierre is is you know he's a member of our Influence One Hundred. He's he's a, he's a, a person of considerable stature in the industry. So, you know, his 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 views warrant, I think, um, are, are, are certainly worth repeating. Uh, and he also said, you know, marketing is in deep trouble. He pointed to the issues around things like fake news, uh, the problems that tech platforms like Facebook are having. And he said that communications, because of its focus on facts, will beat marketing because marketing is more concerned with, with fiction. And I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I, but, but notwithstanding my own thoughts, I mean, is from someone who works in an organization that is a marketing machine, uh, is this, is this uh, conversation even worth having? Is, it, you know, is there a battle? <laughs> will someone win? <laughs> And what will they win? It's 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 the constant vibe between good and evil. No, um, <laughs> right. look, I we we've been talking about this for so long, um, mm. and you know, again, it's almost becoming like a cliche. Um, you know, we're good at listening and marketing on, um, and and all the other arguments which you want to put for the for the case of comms. I think that the the truth is, marketers ahead of marketing, or chief marketing officers. Are more likely to be on a board. They're more likely to be able to be listened to by the CEO, and they're also as well more likely to be able to show the return on investment. Not always, but more likely. Well, you are um, just you're just and, slaying sacred cows here. Just <laughs> well, you know, I I, I don't want to. This you know, is brutal. I, <laughs> Yeah, I hopefully the brotherhood and sisterhood will forgive me. I don't know, man. Um, I think your uh, your pass your pass is going to be revoked. I, I've, been, I've been I've been cast out, yeah, beyond the pale. But you know, I look. I think we we've got to we've got to put our own internal house in order. For example, mm. the issue of ethics, the issue of reputation. You know, I still have family members. Okay, they are in laws to be granted. Who <laughs> who don't even know what I do. Um, mm. And until we're actually able to to clearly say what we do, they're not uh, they're and, not marketers, are they? Um, <laughs> well, they're actually they're actually government officials. So, uh, okay. um, right. Yeah, I, I'm not going to delve more into that one. But yeah, um, until we're actually able to say what we do and what the value is, and actually how we can measure it, we will always be up against you know the bigger marketing brother and sister mm. um, who have more money, who have more influence. And again, who are able to point to, to facts and figures and say, look, we make a bigger difference on the bottom line. You know, you, you may see exceptions. For example, there's a crisis. People always turn to us and say, you know, fix it. Um, mm. But, yeah, I, I think we, we've got to be realistic um, mm. and, and say there is still much work to be done. I mean, but for me, again, let, let's fix our own internal issues first before we go out and, and start 
you know, fighting the uh, the marketing people. Mm. I, you know, I, I, I like the theory behind Pierre's comments, and I have actually heard variations of that argument, specifically that, um, you know, the, these concerns of, about the credibility of information and so on will, will help the communications function. Um, I, 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 I worry about positioning this as a battle. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if, you, if you're at a big company, that the CEO necessarily wants to see it that way. Uh, but be, even beyond that, I mean, the, the research we've done, all of my experience covering this industry, um, and I think Paul, my colleague Paul Holmes would, would, would say the same with his, uh, with his experience as well, is, is we've seen, you know, marketing take the lead, really. And, and when, particularly when functions are integrated, that they're, they're typically led by marketing people because they have bigger budgets and they tend to be listened to more. They may not be better than the comms people, but there are no prizes for being better, right, within a company. Um, well, you know, I'd even ask you this question. How many communicators have you seen um, moving on to head up a combined function? I can actually give you an exact number in answer to that question. <laughs> okay. Which is, I know, it's kind of weird, isn't it? And, and uh, be clear, you didn't tell me you were going to ask me this. Um, so I'm not, I can't tell you, obviously I don't have a definitive number, but from our Influence 100, um, which is our list of, of the top 100 um, communications people in the world. So last year, uh, I think I added up the number of comms people that lead converged functions. I actually, I called them unicorns, or we called them unicorns, because they were so rare. Uh, there were, I think, hang on, I'm just looking now. There were eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sorry, no, ten. There were ten. Of those ten, though, um, I think two have resigned, Beth Comstock and John Iwata. Uh, and at least one has moved on to another role. <laughs> uh, so let's say seven or eight from the Influence 100. So it's not many. Um, and I think we all know there are many more on the marketing side, right? But it's interesting as well because, you know, both Ben and John are B2B. Beth and John, yeah, sure. So it's, it's a much easier, essentially, step to take. Mm -hmm. Whereas B2C, how many comms people, comms leads would move into a head of marketing on the B2C side? None of, I mean, Very on this, few of them. yeah, on this list, none of them are, are B2C. They are all either B2B or professional services like Accenture or um, non-profit. Okay, so there's one consumer company. It's Aston Martin. I'm not sure I'd call that your average consumer company, though. <laughs> yeah, maybe over in Dubai. Um, you know, you've got to pick up one with your milk and bread. But otherwise, yes, yeah, it's, it's a hard sell. I think Aston Martin might as well be B2B, <laughs> realistically. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, we have seen... Um, I think the evidence is clear on this one that marketing is is in pole position, um, and you know if if marketing leaders are taking on board the concerns and the the um, the understanding that comes with that communications role, then then good for them. Do, do you think they are though, or are they just running a combined well, function? And uh, you know, even um, in even. Look, I, I work hand in hand with my marketing colleagues mm. and they see the value that I bring. I see the value that they bring to the table. And we both do our jobs um, with our own specialist hats on. Um, we, we understand what we do. Um, we understand each other. Um, but even in the areas where, say, as communicators, we bring a lot of value. So, for example... Um, social media, looking at engagement and promoting conversations. Um, even the social media uh, folks, the nice people at Facebook and, and Twitter and and the like, are actually not helping because you know it, it's a couple of years back. You know, you could push content out and you could get a good reach. Today, everything is 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 paid, and and that's the challenge that we have as communicators. I think we. We need to understand, and again, I'm sure other people have said it before, that the industry is changing, so we have to change with it. We have to look at new skills. 
we have to understand um, how even traditional elements of our our function are changing. For example, crisis communications. There's going to be so many more crises happening in the future which are related to hacks and leaks. Uh, so essentially, cyber security or, or cyber espionage. And we've got to ask ourselves, are we ready for that? You know, if I go into a room and I ask the people in the room, how many of you have any online certification? Um, how many of you have Google Analytics certification? I'm still not seeing enough communicators sort of stepping up and saying, okay, I'm developing myself and I, I'm investing in my abilities because I need to change as much as my industry is changing. Yeah, it's, it's a really important point. Um, you know, the marketing function is, has become much more closely intertwined, I feel, with technology. Um, and that gives it a, a big advantage. I mean, if you go to a marketing conference, um, you will hear much more about artificial intelligence, uh, about virtual reality, about the way that, that the, the world is changing. And the profile of the average corporate communications leader, I mean, you're self-accepted, of course, um, is sometimes a worry, right? I think often it's someone who's a little bit older, um, it's often uh, someone who's, who's an ex-journalist um, who is almost a gatekeeper, right? Just protecting the CEO from the media. And so it becomes a very reactive mindset um, rather than a proactive mindset. And, and meanwhile, on the marketing side, I often feel like marketers are much more comfortable with risk. They're much less, um, you know, they're much less concerned uh, about making mistakes, much more willing to experiment. Um, and I think a lot of that actually does come down to demographics. So I feel like there are not just quantitative but qualitative reasons why why marketing has um, has kind of emerged as as the sort of dominant engagement function. Um, and, you know, I, 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 it'll be interesting to see what happens, though, because um, clearly there are... It's clear, I think, to... to to every marketer that they need to understand public relations broadly um, as much as they understand the subset of just consumer engagement. I, I've got a feeling, Aaron, this, this conversation will continue on and on next year and year after. And again, until, as you rightly said, we, we get the need to, to look more broadly at what we're doing and, and bring in those outside skill sets, look at technology, how we can leverage it and develop ourselves as, as people within the comms function. Um, otherwise, you know, again, we're just doomed to be gatekeepers, people who do the traditional work over and over again. We, we have to reinvent ourselves. So another question for you. Um, there's been a lot of coverage of the, the problems being faced by publicly held agencies recently um, and you know this has not been a great year for them it's been the worst year for the holding groups since 2009 um, some of it is, is cyclical but it, it does seem like some of it is actually structural and we're in a position now where it's difficult to always see the value of um, these groups that own hundreds of agencies and have to make a certain margin every month to keep shareholders happy. Uh, I don't know how much this question will put you on the spot, but where do you stand on all this, given that you, know, you, you, you are at a company that, that retains a lot of agencies um, and your, you know, your ultimate, ultimate boss, let's say, Mark Pritchard, um, has been very clear. He has said, you know, your complexity to agencies, agency complexity should not be our problem? Um, I would tend to agree. Obviously, I have to say that. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a safe choice. But, yeah, well, you know, well, yeah. Um, no, 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 where, uh, no, where you, uh, no, where you sleep. Um, mm. Again, look, we, we spend the money on the client side. We want to see the results. Um, agencies need to decide what is their best model um, to, to help us get there. But yeah, we, we should not be stepping into to fix the, um, the agencies and how they work. They've got to work this out themselves. 
Um, and you know, you you've got a point. It has been a very very tough year um, mm. for the the holding companies. But having said that, you know, compared to you know other industries, I still think we're in a we're in a pretty decent place in terms of um, at least for you know many of the areas growth margins. Um, and also as well, I think you know having a tough year will help people focus their minds on what they need to do better. And also as well, as we were saying before, look at doing more in terms of uh, innovation, using technology better. I, I think we we still, you know, we still could do so much more in terms of leveraging technology, in terms of getting results, in terms of boosting the ROI, and in terms of doing things differently. And again, look, if you show the ROI and if it's a good ROI, people are not going to have an issue in terms of spending money. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. That's, it's good to hear something positive there because um, a lot of the news has been, has been pretty grim, I think, when it comes to um, holding group results and, and so on. But, but, you know, Aaron, I'd, I'd ask you on, on the same side. How do, you, how do you see the holding companies moving on uh, in terms of their own position, you know, again, being on the outside and being somebody who follows this intimately? Um, I mean, I think the big question is, is it, is it cyclical, like uh, Martin Sorrell um, would like us to believe, uh, or is it structural? How much of it is down to competition from, let's say, management consultancies? Uh, I think... Some of it is, but I don't think I don't think a lot of it is just yet. But I think it, you know that will be a, a an increasing factor. I think the rise of the digital platforms is is really important here, and that's not cyclical, right? That's um, I think clients are increasingly comfortable going direct to the platforms and and maybe not not going via their agency. Um, I think the whole idea of of putting shareholder concerns ahead of client concerns is not necessarily the best model for for today's era. Um, when you need some flexibility with your margin, um, and so I, I mean, you know, no one knows, and, and I don't know, but I don't. I feel like the holding group's best days are behind them. That's my sort of, I guess, it's, it's more than an instinct because I think there's, there's plenty of stuff that has been written about this. Um, I guess we will see what happens next year, right? There are so many agencies. I, I just don't feel like there's enough revenue to go around. Um, and for but it's not only agencies as well, but it's, but it's also, just to add to that, it, it's also mm -hmm. big clients setting up their own in-house uh, yeah. agencies. Yeah, and that, um, and that yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, no question. I mean that that's been going on for a while. I think that's becoming more of a of a trend because they can go direct to the digital platforms, right? So um, it's demystified. <laughs> uh, it doesn't make mean that it's more effective. I should make that point um, because I think there's a lot of stuff <laughs> that that um, that's being done on Facebook, which maybe is is not the best use of of, of budgets, but yeah, I think it's demystified a lot of what, what agencies were were charging for. Interestingly, I think for public relations, it's both an opportunity and a threat because I think for public relations as an industry, there's still a massive opportunity uh, because, you know, the, the, the values of sort of channel neutrality and earned, earned media and, and being agile are, are surely more important now than they were, at any, than they have been at any time. However, what is also clear is that the, the PR agencies at the big holding groups are underperforming even by holding group standards. So, um, it, they, they, you know, that's kind of a, a singular concern, I guess, that, that no matter how you look at it, um, public relations agencies just don't seem to do well uh, at, at, at publicly held companies with a couple of honourable exceptions. It's interesting to bring that up because I think one conversation which has been taking place for a number of years on the marketing side will or should have moved over already to the, the PR side. And that's, again, the issue of, of taking risks. 
Um, mm. I don't think we are good enough at, at being risk takers, either on the, the client side or the agency side. And you know, we have a lot more latitude to take risks because if you look at what PR does versus marketing are often much cheaper and also as well, you know, we can we can take a much more targeted approach towards risk and also technology usage. But mm -hmm. again, I think that's the big opportunity for us. You know, look at being being okay, risk aware, but but stepping up and, and being braver in terms of what we do uh, and how yep. we do it, because everything otherwise is a simply plain vanilla yes. um, to a, a consumer or to a stakeholder. And also as well, you know, as we have been discussing it, is how can we better integrate technology? So. You know, do we do we need to become technologists? You know, you look at what mm -hmm. IBM and Accenture and others are doing in terms of you know, moving and also McKinsey moving into the marketing and, and comm space. We we need to get much better in terms of understanding what technology can do for us. Not be afraid of using it, and also as well, be more aware of, of what the costs are. Because I think you know, if you go to anybody, say you know, how much an app does an app cost? How many people, especially on the client side, could actually tell you that? Um, I can guess in very few without somebody calling up an agency or five agencies or mm. 10 different technology providers. You know, we, we just don't know. They need an app for that, just to tell them how much an app costs. Most of the, there, there's, you know, an opportunity <laughs> for the Homes Report. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, risk is um, the ability to invest ahead of the curve, right, I think is what we're talking about is... And it's something that, by and large, we see much more often on the independent side of the agency game because they don't have to make such a strong case to justify their investment, right? They don't have to deliver a certain margin every month. So where we see that kind of entrepreneurialism is on the independent side. Now, the issue is that most independent agencies are not especially big so True. there's a question of scale then, right? So whilst they might be able to make those investments, are they really going to make that much of a ripple when you're talking about the global industry? Um, so you kind of end up with this sort of a, sort of a standoff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting time, I think, for the agency model. And, you know, I don't get the impression next year is going to be much easier. Do you? Uh, <laughs> looking at the, the global economic uh, outlook, uh, mm -hmm. looking at politics as well, yeah, I, I, you know, if anybody has a crystal ball and tell, can tell you how well the, the world is going to be doing, you know, that, that person should be paid a lot of money because, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody can give you an accurate forecast in terms of where things are going. You know, India seems to be doing well, US is doing well, but things could change in an instant again, with especially with the, um, the, the political choices which are being made. Um, mm. So I think it is going to be a tough year, at least in terms of uncertainty as to what could be happening and what will be happening. And, um, you know, I see it in my region very clearly. There's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. And I also see it in other regions as well. Mm. But your region, so, you know, MENA, Middle East, North Africa, quite bullish on Trump, no? Well, <laughs> certain parts are and certain parts aren't. It's... Uh, Again, uh, you know, he's, he's a bit like Marmite. You either love him or you hate him. Mm. Um, but again, you know, I, I haven't seen it. That the region is going through a lot of change. Um, mm. And yeah. um, stability will help in terms of people making the decisions as to what they want to do. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in terms of you know, where budgets are going, when they're being spent, how they're being spent. And we will see that play through... Um, I think all of 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people need to, you know, you, you can you can make your projections, but just plan conservatively and, and see then what what comes out of it. Mm. But you know, I'd ask you. This is a hundred episodes. Um, <laughs> how do you how do you see things moving forward? And also, especially with the Homes Report, what is next for you guys? Um, what is next for us? Um, well. So we're bringing our conference to uh, Dubai, as I think you're aware. So that's going to happen pretty soon in February. Um, so that's kind of short term in terms of, of new things for us. In terms of the broader industry, um, I, I honestly don't expect a huge uh, you know, fundamental change 
uh, next year because at a time of economic uncertainty, it's rare. You know, you, you'll see incremental, you'll see continued incremental change. I think you'll continue to see the good agencies doing well, and they will actually do disproportionately well during, um, you know, during difficult economic conditions. I feel so they will consolidate their leadership uh, of the industry at, at various levels. Um, but I don't expect to see much in the way of fundamental change. And I, I think, uh, as you pointed out, until we start to see more evidence of wholesale change in terms of skills and talent and even model, um, it's kind of hard to see where that change is going to come from. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm still bullish on the sector as a whole. I think it has a it has a huge opportunity, um, but it needs to move more quickly, as you said. It needs to be more comfortable with risk um, if it's going to grasp that opportunity. And as well, I, I'd add to that. Um, you alluded to. We've got to be much better in terms of. Uh, future proving ourselves through actually doing more development work with with a young generation of, of communicators coming through we, we're not great as an industry in terms of engaging with students university universities with people who are about to come in and also the entry level in terms of helping them develop and also as well learning from them mm. in terms of areas like digital i think that that's that's a massive opportunity for as for people on the client side and also as well people on the agency side. Yeah. Um, we've, we've, we've got to do better with our talent pool. Yeah, I mean, it's, from your perspective, do you find that the way you spend on public relations is changing compared to, say, five years ago? It, it's not changing a great deal. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, still... You know, it's, it's very much agency based. Mm-hmm. Um, it may it may be changing in terms of how we deal directly with the social media channels and the social media companies. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's still very much that agency focus um, and that we, the, we have in place. And the types of services you're buying from agencies are largely the same? Pretty much so, yeah. Mm. Pretty much so. We're, we're looking at doing more work again on the digital side but still you know we, we need to rethink the model as an industry in terms of how clients engage with agencies and and you know what services are buying from them yeah so it's it's easy to i suppose lay all the blame for the woes of, of the world uh you know at the feet of agencies but um you know it's clear that clients also have to shoulder some of the responsibility here, right? Because um, clients have also not been particularly quick to change. Um, you know, you still see marketing and, com- and, and communications run as separate fiefdoms often, um, not always clear where digital resides, uh, and, and, and a lot of risk aversion on the client side too. Um, yeah, you're right. Look, it needs to be a partnership. We, we need to be clear in terms of what we want as clients. And we have to be clear in terms of what we need from agencies. Um, and also as well, you know, looking internally, we need to be clear in terms of who does what. And I still think as an industry, we struggle with that. Um, so, you know, as I said, I think we're going to see the same conversation coming up year after year until we really get a handle on, on what we should own and why we should own it. You know, make a solid business case. Mm. Uh, and make it so solid that marketing turns around to us and says, yeah, you're right. You know, this this is the best or the optimal fit for the organization. Um, so I think 2018 is going to be a lot of introspection for um, obviously issues such as ethics and reputation, but also as well how we do things and why we do things. How can we improve? How can we do better? And we, we have to ask these questions of ourselves. Otherwise, we're just going to repeat the same thing over and over again. Mm. So let's do some predictions. <laughs> because, Always uh, fun. All, Aaron, I'm going to start with you. What's your predictions? Come on. What's your predictions? No, no, I'm going to ask you specific. The next five years. I'm going to ask you specific predictions. 
Um, okay, and I see where this is going. Yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed. So first of all, because um, I've only got a few, but that, more will come to me as we do this. Do you think a PR agency will win the PR Grand Prix for an idea that it conceived itself in 2018? No, I still think the marketing agency will win the idea. Okie doke. Well, there you have it. I'm not going to answer that one. I don't. I don't want any of these. <laughs> okay. I don't want anyone to to hold these the against heads, me. <laughs> you know, bearing down all the eyes looking towards you. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, look, Wagging the, the weight the weight of evidence is clear, right? So, we we know what has happened. Uh, we obviously we hope it will change. Um, okay. Will an, a PR agency be expelled from the PRCA in 2018? That's a tough one. Um, I don't think we're going to see any expulsions. I think we're going to have a lot of frank conversations, but I'm hoping we will stop there and learn our lessons. That's my hope. Okay. I I suppose it it comes down to whether perhaps we feel they've got a taste for it now. But, you know, we'll see. (laughs) We'll see. Yep. Um... (laughs) Will Edelman crack $1 billion in 2018? I'm not sure how closely um, you watch all this stuff. <laughs> but, well, but they're look, getting I, there. I would, I would love to see Edelman or any agency crack that number. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it will be a testament to what a PR agency or as they call themselves a marketing communications agency can do. So I would love to see somebody who does what I do no crack that number. That will be fantastic. We'll get the champagne bottles out. Hmm. Okay. Well, there's three solid predictions from you. I actually don't think Edelman will crack a billion next year. So they won't pass. I don't think they'll pass the billion dollar mark next year because, you know, overall industry growth has slowed. There was a time when they were consistently, they were like the Chinese economy. Um, and much like, <laughs> okay. much like the Chinese economy, they have also slowed as they've got bigger. And, you know, you can't really hold it against them too much. But um, I think on their current growth rate, um, and, and, you know, you, you expect that growth rate to increase uh, this year and perhaps next year. But it, I think it will still take uh, a couple of years. But, yeah, you're right. It'll be a monumental, uh, it'll be a monumental achievement when it happens. Um, any questions from your side on, uh, well, on, on predictions, let, perhaps? Let, let, me, or... let me ask you some predictions. Go on, then. Um, will we do a better job in 2018 of, I think, winning consumer trust? Um, no. But I don't think it's down Why? to... So, okay, I think the industry will do a better job, yes, because I think it, it has been doing a better job year on year. I think it gets better. However, I don't think that will re- result in better trust, if that makes sense. Because I think people are just... People are becoming more sceptical more quickly than the industry <laughs> can, can... Yeah, we can't keep up. That's, exactly, that's right. So this is, I think, the issue. And... Um, you know, I, th- I do think the industry does do better at it. I don't know. What's your view? Um, look, you, you've hit the nail on the head. I think, um, you know, people out there are much more sceptical, which is unsurprising, given mm. what's been happening over the past two years in terms of politics and in terms of business and everything else in between. Um, I think, again, it's going to drive us what has happened to hopefully be more engaging and more transparent. And that would be a start. I also think as well, we, we need to sort of get back to basics um, in terms of how we engage. Mm-hmm. I think we need to realize that, that we can't do every single thing online. You know, we, we've got to start re-engaging face-to-face or do more engagement face-to-face. Hmm. Uh, we've got to understand that you know, even you know, there is a distrust of certain things online or certain digital assets because, again, of the legacy of the past two years. Mm-hmm. And we have to adapt accordingly. So if we if we get that, if we understand it, then we will be able to do a better job in terms of reaching out to consumers or stakeholders 
talking to them, listening to them as well face to face, and hopefully restoring some of that trust, which has uh, has has been possibly lost over the past two years. Mm. Well said. Do you have another question? I have a couple more, at least. Um, will we do a better job of of conveying the brand purpose next year? Oh, oh, what a question. Um, conveying brand purpose doesn't necessarily mean that brand purpose exists. <laughs> so okay, I see. What, okay, turn it around. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to dissemble. I'm going to dissemble your question. Um, I, I'm, I am a little bit cynical. I think purpose has become a <laughs> tactic by which companies are are winning awards. Um, yeah. I think Fearless Girl was a great idea, but they've, they're running into issues about unequal pay at State Street Global Advisors. Yeah. And we'll, I think the industry does a, 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 will do, will do a great job at conveying purpose. I, the, the concern is, is how, um, how authentic that purpose is. Of course. And, and that's where, I mean, doesn't that concern you as well? Um, yeah, I, I, look, I, consumers, it's the same thing. It's, it's that plain vanilla, you know, how do you stand out? Uh, but, but it's gotta be, and it has to be authentic. It, it has to be meant. You can't just simply use it as a gimmick. Um, and I think, you know, we need to understand that you can't just simply put out a, you know, a brand campaign or brand driven campaign, which is built on values if you don't, if you're not sincere about the values which you're uh, espousing, so yeah, we, we've got to do a much better job in this regard as well as an industry, mm. especially with what is going on in politics. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, so a couple more, unless you've got one. No, go on, go on. All okay, yours. will a management consultancy acquire a holding group next year? Mm. Yes, I think Whoa. I think they will do. Wow, okay. one of the smaller holding groups. Okay. Um, I don't think I Which don't one? think Sir Martin has anything you, to worry about. Do you, do you have a <laughs> Do you have a choice? Or you... Um, I I can't actually think of one off the top of my head, but oh, yeah, it's very diplomatic. I think I think it's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be one of the smaller holding groups, I think. I, that, that's a very real possibility. Yeah. And it would make a lot of sense for one of the consulting firms to do that. Do you think so? I, so, I, first of all, I kind of agree with you. I think it will, if it's going to happen, it will be a smaller to mid-size. Does it make sense? I, I, I'm sure there are better things they could spend their money on, surely. Well, if you think about it this way, look, they have the technology awareness. Mm. They have the, um, the credibility... And they have the access to the C level suite. Mm -hmm. Now, what they often don't have is the, the creative spark, which you also need. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where um, the play could and would work. And this is why I'm saying smaller holding company looks. Nobody's going to come in and, and buy WPP from, uh, from the, the marketing, uh, I'm sorry, from the, the consultancy side. I don't know. There but are if rumors. If you bring all those things in together, oh, <laughs> there's always rumors yeah, in terms sure. of listed companies. Um, but I think if you, know, if you merge those those three elements together, you've got a very solid play, especially if you are looking to, to engage at the, the C-suite level, mm. which these guys should be doing if they're looking at the budgets which they, they want to take. Um, and you know that will present an even bigger challenge to the traditional industry, because again, how do you compete with that? Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be an interesting one to watch. It will, I mean, on paper, yes. But I am just skeptical about how these things work in practice. People based. Well, you're a journalist. You, you should be skeptical. <laughs> but no, I mean, even accounting for that, um, even allowing for that, that I don't know. When you when the, these are people based businesses, right? So what you end up with is is a lot of people based businesses being being crushed together and. Um, True. I, I just and as we've seen, wonder. you know, if if you get the if you get the they were the the merger wrong, you know. If the the cultures don't mix, then 
yeah, mm. you'll see a lot of people leaving very quickly. Okay, and my last question for you. Will another agency take on the Guptas assignment? <laughs> uh, if they do, they are much braver than me. Yeah. Um, I would... Maybe they already have. Argue, Maybe it's happened. Uh, look, possibly. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Obviously, just been very reticent in terms of announcing it, whichever agency, brave agency, has taken it on. I wonder why. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wonder why as well. Look, mm. I think you know the argument everybody has the right to a voice. You oh, can no, you can say that, and, and many people have. They don't. But you know, there, not... there, there are some there are some you know brands which really are toxic, and, yeah. and even the banks yeah. are not taking on Gupta money. So yeah. how an agency even would get paid, I would not know. Yeah, it's it's kind of comes down to my my long-standing kind of view. Of which agency, and this is okay. So this could be my my final. This promise. This is uh, my final Go question. For it. If anyone's actually still listening at this point, um, <laughs> will an agency start working for the North Korean government next year? <laughs> I mean, you know, there are many that can't. Let's be clear here. You know, because of sanctions and so on. But uh, there are many that can. <laughs> So. Oh, I tell you what, if, if there is, Aaron, I'm sure you will get the scoop and I'm sure it will be very <laughs> widely read, uh, not only in Washington, but across the, uh, the globe God. when the, it comes the, to the industry. Yeah, the, the pressure's on now. That would be, that would be quite know, a story. You know, th- th- there, is, there is bravery and then there is insanity. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I wouldn't push the bravery element that far. Cool. Right, I do. I have to run. I think you have to run. This has been a huge amount of fun. I hope I hope our listeners enjoy our hundredth episode as much as we did. Um, Alex, thank you so much for your time. We will have you on again soon. I'm sure. Uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you, Aaron. Um, cool. And I'll see you. You're in, the most in... cynical journalist out there. Oh, I'm not. Apart surely from Paul, not. So it's no, surely not. Or you know, you, you push it every now and then. <laughs> yeah, there it's are been, some, uh, there been are a some... lot of fun. There are some really hard-bitten hacks out there. I, I, I've been known to smile and uh, even, <laughs> even, believe, even believe official comments occasionally. Uh, um, anyway, so thank you so much. I'll see you in Dubai soon. Um, thank you all for listening. Please do uh, rate and review us on iTunes. Um, get in touch with us. We're always happy to hear your thoughts, your feedback, your questions. We'll be back soon. Thank you very much. You've been listening to The Echo Chamber. Brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by Marketeers. Sponsored by March Communications, connecting innovation and people.